My name is John Rollins, and I want to thank you guys for coming tonight, or this afternoon. Um, I've spent most of my life, it seems like, um, working with Fourier derivative programs or algorithms for extracting cycles in historical data. I was very fortunate in the early days of trading, because uh, I started trading very young, or very early, like 24, 25 years old, and I happened to be friends with an aerospace engineer that had done a lot of work with various algorithms that I showed him a book that I had read uh, by J.M. Hurst uh, called Profit Magic of Stock Transaction Timing that dealt with extracting cycles from historical data uh, from a purely mathematical perspective. And I showed this information to this engineer and he said at the time that he had just developed algorithms for predicting structural failure of components on the C-130 airplane. And he said the algorithms that J.M. Hurst was trying to work with and deal with in his books was a basic Fourier analysis. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Fourier analysis. Um, it's, it has its merits, but in the traditional sense, Fourier is hit or miss in analyzing data. And the reason for that is traditional Fourier would work with a structured or a fixed length of data. And in doing that, it would miss some of the true long-term cycle summations that were giving you a true reflection of what was happening in the marketplace or whatever the data that you're trying to analyze. So I became the grunt worker, I'll put it that way, for this aerospace engineer because he started developing these algorithms and said, I think we can take this algorithm or the algorithms that he's developing and start testing data and really trying to understand why you know, certain types of mathematical extractions that we were working with this, with the traditional Fourier were not working. So anyway, I'm getting kind of off. The bottom line is I spent years taking the algorithms, filtering data, and looking at different ways to extract cyclical components in the historical data, and giving a, a forecast that was meaningful. So I'm going to go through this real quickly. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of stuff because I'm basically wanting to focus on why Fourier analysis um, in certain ways that can be applied and can be useful in giving real long-term forecasts because what you're trying to do is take a historical database, find the components in that database that are truly cyclical. And, and, and from a cyclical standpoint, if you can imagine a force moving through a plane and going through time, and that force expands and contracts, speeds up and slows down, that is a true cycle mathematically that we can work with, especially when we go through a process of going back over time to see how if there was any shift in the amplitudes or the strength of the cycle or the phase angle of the cycle and that it was meaningful. So once you have found cycles that are really driving the force of the data, force of the market, and then we go through a process of doing a summation of all those different cycles, we get a forecast. So this program in analyzing the historical data we detrend or smooth the data to try to get a better harmonic resolution. And what I mean by that, let me skip over a couple of things here. In this chart, for example, the blue line, the blue center line, is the cycle summation of a number of frequencies that I found to be relevant to the forecast. When it, the red into the future is a future forecast. Understanding that only a certain percentage of a market's behavior is cyclical. We don't have the holy grail. You can't say that we can forecast everything absolutely perfectly, but we can, taking the right historical analysis and understanding the proper way of looking at the data, we can give you a forecast that's relevant into the future within parameter, within certain bands, or within parameters of an overbought, oversold condition, like you're seeing here with this analysis, this specific graph. When you would reach an upper parameter or depart from the center cycle summation, you have a very high probability of moving back to the mean. 
So we're not just trying to also give you a forecast, we're also, also trying to find a way to trade and make money. Because again, I started working on this with the sole purpose of making money. I'm not a mathematician, my background was biology. I just got into this because I was a trader. I used this when I worked in Chicago. I know this has very meaningful uh, forecast ability, but it took years of understanding when you're filtering through the data, what is relevant and what is not. So I'm going to show you something real quickly here. We'll go through this. This is the old original program that I, okay, back in the, I guess, late 80s, we were trying to come up with a way of isolating the cycles, looking at their modulus and the strength of the cycles that we call the spectrum, and then being able to do a summation and project forward. This specific projection is, a, I think, a nine-year forecast, or almost 10-year forecast, on the Dow Jones Industrial Average Monthly Data. And the reason this is so significant is I did pull together a database built by a group. So I have data on the Dow Jones going back to the late 1700s. This actually goes back to 1789. So it's allowing me to isolate long-term cycles and do a forecast. The red is all forecast. So what I would do back then is I would phase through the data, which when I say phase, I'm increasing the length of analysis, and then as I walk forward, actually looking to see if you have a true forecast summation for 10 years. And this allows me to Actually, if you can understand what we're doing, we're doing a window in time, analyzing and projecting through that time, and then as it goes forward, once you see an overlay that matched, then you've under, you, you're finding what we call the frequency domain. You're finding that sweet spot in a mathematical cyclical analysis that is giving you a harmonic re resolution that is giving you an accurate forecast. Because the whole bottom line here is I want to come up with a forecast that is meaningful that I can use in trading or investing because this was the beginning and this is showing you how we did it with the monthlies and I've broken it all the way down to a one minute time frame. But to do the very short term, we'll get into how, we, how we're able to come up with that. But as you can see on the left, the spectrum and the modulus, you're able to see the cycles, the amplitude or strength of the cycle. And so as we phase through time, we'll watch this and you'll see at some point this was what we call the old manual process, that you'll find an overlay that go, this summation of cycles accurately predicted the last 10 years of the stock market. Now, the reason I know this is valid is I will show you later, I've printed articles since 2002 using this, and it has been absolutely dead off. I mean, it's been very accurate. So this is not theory. This is... Everything you see here today has been used in the market in some way, some form or fashion. So as we phase through this and we get to the end, I would then increase the number of frequencies or increase the number of cycles, the summation of cycles, to actually focus in on how we can get it even a little bit more shorter term. But as you can see over here, you can see the strength or the amplitude of the cycles changing as you go through time. So now we're getting close to the end. And at this point, you can see the basic cycle waveform is very, very similar to what was actually happening. So we're, give, we're getting a very good resolution. So as I put in more cycles, look how it actually accentuates the amplitude of that last high. This, by the way, happens to be, I think, coming into uh, early 2018. This is why I published an article saying, I think we're going down to 2020. So I'm not trying to tout my opinion of the market, but <laughs> when you look at that, you go, it's pretty incredible. Okay, so again, this is not using fundamentals. This is purely extracting long-term cycles that are embedded in the price. And this is how we basically did it back in the late, or how I did it back in the late 80s um, and into the early 90s using this old manual program. Well, since then, um, and understanding how you phase through the data, um, 
you have to come up with a way of finding the cycles or the frequencies uh, in a much more complex manner if you're looking at five minute or daily data. And to show you how we did this, and to show you how quantitatively significant this process is, I, would, I took, for example, this is the CRB index, index data, which I have commodity index data going back for over 300 years, so I'm able to look at some real long-term cyclical information from the data. And to do the phasing in a programmed way, I would start, when I say, when it says EP low is 400, EP high is 1200, that just means I'm starting with data point 400, or 400 data points, analyzing through the data mathematically, and then making a window projection of 150 data points offset, which means I walk through the data, make the projection through those 150 data points, and doing that from 400 to 1200, it will come up with parameters that we have pro that we have set up so that we can really say, okay, what was the length of data that we would be analyzing in the old manual process that I just showed you, I'm trying to get to it mathematically. So I let it float, what we call a variable length floating transform, which is something that we developed. The old um, Fourier analysis, which was a fixed length transform, we now have a variable length floating transform. So we can float through the data and find that optimum, uh, what I call estimation period, or that optimum frequency domain. So when it would float through uh, for 4,000 or 41,200, with an offset of 150, it found the suggested sweet spot at 732 and 13 cycles. Okay, so let's take it 12 months into the past, which is a 162 offset. Look what it came up with, 732 and 13. That is so quantitatively significant, or statistically significant, because it's doing a complete in-sample, out-of-sample search through 150, then I did back it up 162, and it still came up with the same parameter. Look where it went when I went back 24 months. Look when I went back 36 months. And when I go back 48 months, yes, yeah, off one data point, but it's still primarily finding the main summation, the main cycle amplitudes. All the way down to, this is 132 months back, and it's a 729. That tells me that this program owns the CRB index. I mean, this is, this is so significant because it is showing us that in our in-sample, out-of-sample test, it came up with almost the exact same parameters all the way through. So this is how this works. This is a mathematical approach, and we are trying to apply it to one minute, five minute daily data, all the way up to the yearly or monthly. But one of the things that makes this significant is I'm going to walk you through this because this was the forecast on January 31st of 2008 using those inputs. Now, again, this is the Commodity Research Bureau Index. It's a big, long-term historical database and is, you know, maybe not something that you can trade, but you can have an idea that we do have a valid capability of forecasting behavior within certain parameters. We're not, we don't have the holy grip, but we do have something from understanding a math, you know, from mathematically extracting cycles, you can find something that works. So as I walk through this, this was in January of 2008. I go to the next year. This was an update using the same, the next set of parameters, January of 2009, showing projected low and turning back up. This is 2010, this is 2011, this is 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, Saying we should go down, 2019. So when you look at this, after going through that, you have confidence that the overall Commodity Research Bureau Index 
would still be trending lower into late 20, 2019. So this is why it's so important in doing computerized cyclical analysis that you find a method that can help you find that sweet spot or that frequency domain. Because you can analyze a block of data for 10 years and you, you may get a good forecast or you may not because it may not have been able to sink in and get synced up with the right cycles. Because I don't believe in what we call the singularity approach. I don't believe in a 20 week or four year because I had a, a friend of mine that writes a newsletter the other day and he sent me a piece saying, oh, this cycle had an inversion. A cycle, in my opinion, can't have an inversion. We're trying to explain a cycle's shift or changing by the virtue of its strength and it's slowing down a little bit, but it's, it's how it's related and forecast with all the other cycles that combine with it that make up the real market. So we don't come at it from a singularity approach. We come at it from a complete composite mathematically. So I'm going to go, for example, back to the Dow Jones. I wrote this in 2002 calling for a major low in 2002 to low in 2003. This was not luck. This was 40 years of work trying to filter data on a long-term database and really understanding that there, there are cycles that we can identify and isolate mathematically and not have, you know, this trying to visually look at the 30 week or 20 week or four year, whatever. Um, and then in 2007, I wrote articles graphically displaying how we would go down into 2009. Again, this was not luck. This is strictly, and it's trying to take me out of the picture. This was strictly a mathematical approach. And the only reason I'm showing is I'm not trying to tout what I do. I'm trying to show validity to how we were able to, over 40 years, finding that, that frequency domain because computerized cyclical analysis is hit or miss. If you just started up tomorrow and said, I'm gonna go get the canned off the shelf, you know, FFT analysis and filter data, well, you might get, a, you will get a forecast, but there's no way of knowing if it's valid. Um, and this was what Modern Trader, I mean, uh, Futures Magazine wrote up, they said, good call, because this was the projection right there was in 2007, and this is what actually happened. I mean, so we were actually graphically displaying the decline that we were looking forward into 2009. So if you're really looking for a way of having something that can have long-term predictive value, you need to go and, and, and research the uh, applications that are available in some areas for getting these, these programming, the, I mean, the, the programs, for doing computerized cyclical analysis. The problem is, you know, you've got to really learn what experience, what I've experienced over 40 years, is how do you find the optimum length of data that you're going to analyze to give you a valid forecast? So, anyway, just to give you a little backup, I mean, this, um, they, they rated you on your, your calls and in crude oil, natural gas, I got five stars. I got a lot of five stars. In fact, I think I got more five-star ratings than anybody else in future. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm sorry. Now, I shouldn't even be doing this. I'm just trying to do this to add validity, okay? I'm not trying to tout the success, believe me. I'm not here to sell anything. I'm just here to talk about computerized cyclical analysis that I've spent my life developing, and this just shows that there was some, some value here. So, um, anyway, I didn't mean to get off on that. That was not, was not with my intent. Is there, who here has an experience in working with computerized cyclical analysis? Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts or questions with what I've been saying? Uh, 
Exactly. And, 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 but that happens. Well, well, that's... Well, it's not predictive. It's actually what I call feedback. If you do add too many frequencies back in, you will get feedback. Well, that's a good point. And see, well, right. Well, we do provide it, but we do not provide the program. We do all of our, if we provide it to somebody, we provide the inputs so that we don't give anyone the ability to take our program and, and do their own testing. It is. Well, we are on NinjaTrader. We'll be on TradeStation shortly uh, and MetaTrader. Uh, we have a website, but I really want to focus on what you're saying, which is, you, you're, you're right. If you put too many frequencies back in, you get a, a feedback. And what our, our whole focus from an analytical standpoint and applying this is to find the cycle summations that are meaningful and understand that only a certain percentage of markets behavior is cyclical. And when a report comes out or a 9-11 event happens, that creates anomalies that will, will skew the analysis for that period of time. And those are out there. That, that's why I'm saying. Well, exactly. And and you find, and the best example, I mean, back in ninety in two thousand one nine eleven, I was trading. Um, I had people. We were looking for a cycle low projected into September, and all of a sudden you have this huge drop because of nine eleven. It creates, you know. Um, you said it's an outlier, but it was amazing how within a few months we came back to the mean and we're back to you know normal, uh, more normal, more normal analysis from that. So you can't you can't predict predict 9/11 events. You can't predict statements. Those are the other percentages of the market's behavior that are influenced outside of cyclicality. The whole goal of a computerized cyclical analysis is to find cycle. Um, the, the cycles amplitude, phase, angle, frequency, and find if they're constant over time, and find if it's a real cycle. And then you figure out ways to use it for investing, because you can come up with great forecasts, but you've got to test it over time, have confidence in it, before you would make a trading decision or investment decision. So, you know, we're, I mean, I've spent my life testing. I mean, that was, that was my job, was to take the programs and analyze data. And I've analyzed every um, major index and looked at the, um, the results. And I see a lot of markets that have a very high percentage of cyclical behavior and a lot of markets that are very random and volatile, you know, and are hard to utilize with a cyclical program. Any questions? I applied to over 100 stocks, and the reason is with this, with looking with a mathematical approach like this, I have to work with stocks that have over 30 years of data. I have to have a lot of history. I feel very insecure applying this to a stock that's, say, been around for 10 years. So my focus is with big cap stocks. That's how I've always invested. That's how I've always applied it, uh, as well as indexes that have a lot of history. I like the S&P and the Dow because I have a lot of history to work with and analyze. Um, so, and I also do a lot of, uh, the other application with this that is very important 
is what I call or a commonality. In other words, look for if a weekly analysis is up, a daily is up, you know, does it agree with your monthly? Um, or if you break it down to the smaller time frames, you know, look at does the 60 or 120, com, you know, have correlation? So I work with time frame um, comparison. I don't just say, okay, my daily is up, the cycles on the daily is up, but then, and, and take a trade, not realizing that, oh, my weekly says, hey, it's rolling over. You might get a little up, but you, you probably have some negative pressure. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. I, I mean, that was really where I applied it when I was trading in Chicago. I applied it to five minute, 15 minute data. But, um, you know, you really have to, I think, in this type of approach, do comparisons. Yes. Any? <laughs> no, but believe it or not, we do have uh, wheat prices going back to the year 1259. Um, I guess the longest we have is wheat and I think cattle going back to that far. I was very fortunate back in the 80s, uh, late 80s, I think, to purchase a database from a research group that was going out of business that uh, had had these guys that were scientists or whatever, researchers, that had gone back and spliced data from the U.S. back to England. So they built some incredibly long databases, which has given us an invaluable tool for coming up with long-term forecasts. Because from a mathematical standpoint, since we don't try to look at fundamentals, we're looking at it strictly mathematically. And when you're applying an algorithm like this to data, the more data, the better. No, <laughs> no, no, I am not a math nerd. I mean, I'm surrounded by them, and, but I've been the guy that goes into the trenches with the data and spends days and days analyzing a data set. Yes. Which one? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, um, I found this to be, from the standpoint of the numbers, looking really good. It looks great on a Disney and bad on a GE. You know, and I think that maybe because maybe Disney was much more focused in their industry and GE was so diversified. So, yes. Is not what it worked like. The way I approach it is let the numbers tell me. You know, let the numbers tell me. If it, it just says stay away from GE, focus on a Disney, focus on a Merck. You know, focus. Right, right. It went from right. I agree. Well, it's not just the parks, it's also a media, multimedia company. And, but still, for some reason, Disney's numbers, when we run the analysis mathematically, the numbers look really good on Disney. So I feel good if it says to buy it, 
you know, I feel I feel confident. Um, but the other stocks, like the drug stocks, the oil stocks, those are, are sort of my bread and butter as far as looking at the numbers and saying I have something that you know can give me a good resolution. You know, but you're but someone like like GE, it's a different company than it was sixty years ago. But by the way, speaking of deer, it does work well on deer. So, well, well, I don't really have more data on the futures contracts themselves. Now, I trade futures, but I, if I'm looking at a daily analysis, I will go back to looking at an S&P cash, because I have data on the S&P cash daily back to 1920s. I have data on the Dow Jones going even further back than that. So I might look at my longer term forecasts using a cash index, but I would look at, if I'm trading an E-mini futures, I might look at a 5 and a 15 for a trade because I do have plenty of data when I look at, at pure data because I will, I will usually pull in at least twelve to 13,000 data points to work with a, an intraday futures. How does it look now? Well, um, I wasn't going to get into trying to tout what I do, but I'll be glad to. The, uh, the analysis is... Well, it looks like this. It's, it's a, this is a detrended price analysis underneath. We have the actual price up top, so you can reference the actual price of the specific commodity. I think this is a daily crude. Um, and underneath, you would see a forecast like this. And what we look for, in fact, I bring it up right here. Um, we try to look at the highlighted areas when we reach those an upper or lower extreme. Because again, it's back to mathematical analysis like this is not 100%. We're not able to give you exactly tomorrow's behavior. But if you reach Go back. If you reach this upper limit or get in what we call our, our opportunity zone or the bands, you have a very high probability of moving back to the mean, moving back to the middle, as well as the cyclical projection itself being negative and showing it going down. We have both. We have a web-based product that is what we call our end-of-day analysis, where you can log in and look at the analysis of the daily Disney or the weekly Disney or the daily Euro USD and the, or the weekly, and purely see the analysis on the on the web. Now we have currently live analysis. If you downloaded our software uh, for like for Ninja Trader, and we'll have TradeStation and MetaTrader very shortly. Uh, and with those programs, you just log in, download our program, and you would see the live analysis graphed just like this, whether it's a one minute, five minute, or 15 minute. And our whole focus here is to provide the mathematical analysis as an, a, an extra tool. I mean, we really help good traders become great traders because if you already got a good system and you have a confidence in your manage, money management process, this gives you an, an idea that you should be patient or the cyclical direction is still moving. And um, so, you know, it's, it's an extra tool in the trader's toolbox, but it's very dynamic, it's interactive, it's, it's changing as new data comes in and giving you a, for, a graphical forecast. So, but my whole focus here tonight was to really explain that computerized cyclical analysis uh, historically has been put down because traditional Fourier has its limitations. What we did in my working for 35 plus years is to just keep applying it and finding how do we measure the 
the database to find that what I was calling the, the, the sweet spot, the frequency domain that's giving us a really valid forecast. Well, I've applied it to uh, economic statistics. I've applied it to weather. I've applied it to everything that I can get historical data on. And anybody that would have any special data that would like to have analyzed, I would be glad to analyze that. That's been my job. I'm a data nut. So. But um, any other questions? One you should ask. I had a guy uh, email me this past week uh, wanting me to analyze the South African RAND and a couple of the indexes down there. So yes, as long as there's the data, we can apply it. Well, it just depends. Um, I mean, I can get by with 20. I'd like to have 30. That's why I'm saying it. with the stocks, I'd like the, the more the better. And the numbers will tell us. I mean, we can get 15 or 20 years of data and analyze it, and I might see so much volatility in the numbers that you go, look, I'll give you a forecast, but I don't know if you can really believe in it. Yes. Well, all of my entry, all of my entry day, I usually pull in at least 12 to 13,000 data points. So, and, and again, the way that we do, as I showed you with that CRB data series, that analysis of the data mathematically, when you start working with one minute data, you start refreshing that process daily. Whereas that CRB, you could do it once a year because it's monthly data, but if you're working with one minute data and there is so much volatility and change ongoing in the amplitude and phase angle of those of that data set, you almost need to constantly be reanalyzing the data. Well, no, I mean, you have to, basically, you're trying to keep up with what's new data coming in and reanalyzing to see, and then make sure you're in that frequency domain. So, and again, in trading a one minute, you're basically going for a half a tick. I mean, you're, you're, you're trading so short term, and you have to, and that's part of our process too right now is to build this completely automated so that, you know, if the cycle projection is up, it buys up, it's down, it sells it, but we have a stop that's, you know, instant. You're not, we're not trying to make long-term trading decisions on a one-minute chart. Are we having, a, do we have an institutional product? I really have no clue. I mean, I've been doing this in a box in a lot of ways. Um, I, am, I apply this to ETFs, to the top ETFs. I apply it to uh, right, a little over 100 stocks. And um, so, you know, it, I sort of live in my own little box here. <laughs> yes? To what? Oh, yes, we're going to have it. Yes. Uh, right now, we've got about 25 or 30. We've got all the, I mean, all the way down to the New Zealand. I mean, we've got the major, ma more than the major pairs. Uh, the cost is from $199 per month for the live or end of day to $399 per month uh, if you get the total package, all the markets and all the different data sets. Um, I'll give you my card here before you leave. Um, the website is quantcycles.com. 
and you can read about this. But um, no, this is you know this is just a program that I've spent my life working on and seen it work, seen it make predictions that would just blow your mind. Um, so um, it's made money. But um, I didn't come here to talk about making money or trading or bragging. I really just, and the only reason I brought up showing the history was it has worked, you know. I mean, and it worked after many years of failures. I mean, many years of testing and analyzing data going, oh, this is a forecast, and, and it didn't work, so why did it not work? So. <laughs> well. That's the bottom line, and that's what's kept me in it, is I, I see things every day that um, um, are just a res, you know, result of my, a lot of years of work. Which market? Um, the Dow, I think we're going down to 2020. Um, my daily short-term stuff, you know, we could hang around another month or two, uh, but I think that the real... Um, the real momentum of the market peaked in 2018. And I think we're going down. Um, and I think we're going down in an amplitude equivalent to 2007. So it could be significant. Um, I don't know why. I don't know the fundamental reason. I mean, there's a lot of things you can come up with that could break the market. And I didn't come here to really be bearish on the market because I'm a trader. I mean, I could be going long tomorrow, but as far as the overall, my monthly analysis that we referenced earlier, it says we're down to 2020. The S&P? Well, the S&P is based on the rule of commonality. It's going to go down with it. You know, it's, I just don't have the data on the S&P going back to really give the, the reference like I do with the Dow. So... Um, Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Well, what I learned over the years of testing data is applying the traditional Fourier analysis to price data, especially if you're looking at like a Dow Jones, he goes over the last 40 years from the bottom left-hand corner to the top right-hand. That is what we call a trend impact. So it will heavily skew a mathematical analysis uh, as far as really trying to extract real predictive value when your data basically goes from here to here. What you want is data that goes in a range. So I smooth or detrend the data, which decreases my amplitude as far as the predictive value, but it increases my timing, which is why I'm able to say we, could, we should go down from you know, May to July I don't know if we're going to go down 100 points or 1,000 points, but I have confidence that the cyclical periodicity is down during that time frame based on the ability to detrend the data and get more cyclical harmonics from that information. Does that make sense? Well, we're trying to put it in a linear format, a 0 to 100 scale. And so we apply the algorithm to this, the black line, the detrended, and not apply the algorithm to the actual data. But we're making the forecast on this. It works out to be the same. I mean, it, it's, again, like I said, we don't know necessarily that between May and July we're going to go down 100 or go down, or go down 1,000. Good question. Well, guys, thank you very much for attending. I hope it's been informative.